See, this is why we need to get away from plastics and have more biodegradables. Hey folks, classic Doctor Who review. This one I put up to vote on my Patreon page as to what third Doctor story I was going to do this time. And wow, it was close. It was insanely close. Like, I was starting to think that I was going to have to step in and put in my own vote to break a tie between, like, three out of the four options. But ultimately, it did sort itself out by one vote. Holy cow. <laughs> People were really invested in, uh, in which of these. But uh, it ended up being Terror of the Autons. So this was the first story from John Pertwee's second series as the Doctor. It marks the return of the Autons, who made their debut in his very first story, Spearhead from Space, and it also marks the introduction of Roger Delgado as the Master. So, lots of firsts in this one. And it's... It's one of those things where I recognize why it's important because so many things are introduced, so many concepts, so many characters, and uh, oh, first appearance of Joe Grant, appearance of Joe Grant, apparent, God, why can't I talk these days? A uh, first appearance of Joe Grant amongst others, so she's new to this whole thing, and yeah, you know, there's a lot of of stuff like that in here, but. And there's some, some of the things I'm gonna complain about, I know just have to do with the time that it was made. I get that, but I'm sorry. If it takes me out of it, it takes me out of it. I can't help it. So the big thing I'm going to complain about, and I've complained about this with Third Doctor specifically before, it's the green screen, or it would have been blue screen at the time. Green screen was... That was fancy technology. We didn't have it yet. But it, it's, it's the blue screen compositing effects. And here's the thing. I'm not annoyed because they look bad. Actually, some of them even look pretty decent. But even the ones that don't look good, I'm not irritated because they don't look good. I'm irritated because they get employed in situations where I find myself thinking, why is that an effect? Why don't you just, why don't you just have a backdrop? Like, there's a scene early on when the Master is kind of infiltrating this sort of tower research place, and there's like this, there's like two shots, really quick shots of, I guess it's a bunch of computer banks, and it's a blue screen effect, and it's really obvious that it's a blue screen effect, you know, that's behind him. Now, okay, I can maybe buy that for something this quick. They didn't want to build a set like this or it was too much of a pain to get into a place with actual computer banks. It could have been anything. It could have been a warehouse. We didn't have enough established about this location that was vital that you show me computer banks. There's no need to have this effect there. And there's a number of shots where it's like really close in on the head and there's clear blue screen going on behind them. And I'm like, if you're going to pull in that close, just put a still image. Just, just like, drop a sheet. Something. Like, you couldn't tell me you had no backgrounds just on hand that would have been workable to cover a shot this tight. Come on. I mean, there's using technology that isn't going to age well, and then there's leaning on it like a crutch when there's no reason not to use something else. It could not have been more difficult just to do it any other way. I've dwelt on this way too long, but it really did. I, I burst out laughing at a lot. Um, but... <laughs> Get that. I'm, here was the idea of me leading off with that. I'm trying to get it behind me so I can I can actually focus on the story and everything. So, introduction of Joe Grant at the front end. It's interesting, especially coming off of Liz Shaw, who was introduced with the idea of her being something closer to the Doctor's intellectual equal. Not truly. Nobody ever is. But, you know, someone more in his ballpark who could keep up with him. Now, the actual reality of what ended up happening with that character is she largely just 
fetched him stuff, which is kind of joked about at the start of this because the Brigadier, when um, the doctor complains that Joe Grant isn't qualified, the Brigadier says, you're basically just going to have her fetch things and get coffee. She can do that, which is basically an internal acknowledgement that ultimately that's all we had the woman who we claimed was a scientist do. So I guess we don't need anyone with a PhD. Now, that said, as kind of belittling as the setup for Joe's introduction is, Katie Manning has great rapport and great chemistry with uh, John Pertwee. So that, honestly, good dynamics and chemistry between characters papers over a lot of sins. And that certainly is the case here. So that helps, and I get the, the sense of their dynamic and how they, they vibe together really early on, and it plays well. I'm actually, I really appreciate, the more I get into, especially earlier, um, aspects of uh, of John Pertwee's time and the third doctor with the Brigadier, the more I appreciate the kind of adversarial nature to that relationship. I think the thing was, most of the things I'd, I'd initially seen the Brigadier in were later on, and so there was a much more reverent, you know, oh, old friend sense of it here, whereas here, they, they definitely have tension between them. The doctor doesn't always have a lot of respect for the Brigadier and certainly uh, is belittling of, you know, the the military in general, which, first of all, I mean, tracks, especially after the events of something like Doctor Who and the Silurians. But it's just nice to see some that kind of dynamic at play, especially knowing that they're going to kind of soften towards each other as time goes on. That's just, that's just nice to see. But boy, can the third Doctor be a dick! It's, it's crazy. He starts walking away during a briefing where the Brigadier's going through all these points, like point seven, point eight. Will you, where are you going? You know, stay, you know, that kind of thing. He's like, oh, did you need me? And the Brigadier finishes like, oh, are you done now? It's like, oh, doctor, you jerk. Lovable jerk. Like, I really, he's so charming. He is so charming that he gets away with it. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, he's kind of a dick, which actually is all the more fitting in an episode like this that's going to introduce the Master and very blatantly line him up as something of a parallel and adversary for the Doctor, That he, the idea being that he's the Moriarty to the Doctor Sherlock Holmes. And having the Doctor be a little bit of a prick in this one actually plays into that because you, there's actually some really uh, well put together parallel things going on. So like the doctor early on, when, once they know it's the master who's at play in all of this, he says, it, I forget the exact line, but it's something to the effect of his arrogance is his weakness. And then later the master's talking about the doctor saying the, his curiosity is his weakness. Like they both know each other and they both have pretty good knowledge of what's going to trip the other one up. And that gets laid out right at the beginning. That's pretty impressive. The master really does come into the story fully formed, owing quite a bit to the performance by Raj Delgado. He has this intensity about him that honestly he would have made a great Bond villain. I, I don't mean like the Master as a character. I mean Roger Delgado as an actor. Oh, man. He could he could just hold the screen and he just give this look, and you're like, oh, crap. And he definitely has a look where it sells the idea that just by locking eyes with people, he is hypnotizing them. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I buy it. <laughs> so a lot of this story is buoyed by the performances. Um, the Brigadier, Joe Grant, the Doctor, the Master, they're all great in isolation. They all play very well off each other. Everyone else is fine, uh, does does the work. I like, there's been a little tweak on the design of the Autons that I actually quite like because previously they were just, they just looked like mannequins. That was kind of it. This time there's a little bit of an obscuring of the face and there's almost like a deliberate no there's no eyes on this face you know with that same plastic sheen and it's way more unsettling than the mannequins ever were there's also the plastic doll which like i <laughs> is kind of scary in theory and actually the effect isn't terrible it just hasn't aged well 
but certainly for the time. And it's one of the better blue screen effects that they have when this thing that has been, you know, shown just about this big. Plastic thing starts moving around. It's very obviously someone in a suit that looks the same as the figure, you know, moving around and has been shrunken down and composited in blue screen to look smaller. But it, it works pretty well. I get the feeling that they really went out of their way to very carefully composite those shots. It, there felt like there was a lot more care going on with the effect there than with some of the occasions where I bitched. Um, but it's, it's one of those things like, Sure ain't scary now, but I could see where that would be a little unnerving then. Um, it is a bit campy, though, at times. And honestly, I don't mean that as a as a complaint. Because especially for things from the era that this was coming from, at the time that it was made, campy stuff from that era usually was campy just because that's just what it was. My problem with campy elements these days in modern times is usually it's people deliberately trying to be campy. And when you're deliberately trying to be campy, that almost always means you fail at it. Because the true appeal of camp is taking something dead serious and treating it seriously, but it's ridiculous. And it's preposterous. I mean, like, you go back and you watch Adam West in the old Batman TV show, every line delivery he has is dead serious. No matter what insanity he's talking about or how ridiculous the villain he's bringing on, he always delivers that line dead serious. And that's what you need, and this has that. But there are there are also all those moments in Camp of Things where it's like, the fact that you're taking this seriously is actually kind of funny. Um, so like in this one, the <laughs> there's a... Oh, there's a point. And funny enough, I saw this done as a GIF, like, for the first time shortly after watching this episode, so the timing was kind of funny. Actually, also speak of, speaking of timing, this story starts with a circus, and the last one I did prior to this was um, Greatest Show in the Galaxy. Yeah, I'm going to make these weird connections in the middle of the thing. Welcome to my ADHD brain. This is what happens when I don't take notes and structure my thoughts ahead of time. Anyways, oh my goodness, where was I? Oh, yeah, so... And I I ended up seeing a gif of this later, but the doctor, he's on the phone with the master. And this has been set up that a new phone with a longer cord was installed in his office. And the cord is plastic. And because the master is has aligned himself with the Nestine and the Autons, that means that he, he does this little sound signal over the phone. That means the cord comes to life and starts wrapping around the doctor. And it's just this thin cord and the doctor there. Ah, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. Oh, I really did love it, but it made me laugh. And it was the cliffhanger of all things for that episode. Oh dear. But like some of the campy aspects just give it charm. Like the tissue compressor that the master uses to kill people, to shrink them down this big. That's ridiculous. But I love the sincerity of it. And this really does sort of feel like a statement of purpose for this point in Doctor Who, and especially wanting to give the third Doctor more of a James Bond kind of feel taking on a villain like the Master who is masterminding and planning these things and they're, they've got competing gadgets. Oh, and it's actually, the Master's got a really cool intro. You just hear the TARDIS sound and this sort of van appears. You're like, what? Because we haven't seen other TARDISes in the show up to that point when this thing aired and he just steps out. Who is this guy? I don't know, but you immediately have my attention. It's a it's a brilliant intro, especially if you consider at the time what what just the implication of his existence means. There are like little nitpicks, structural things. Like there's a lot of time devoted to figuring out what the hazard of these plastic daffodils is. And I, I too much time is sunk into that because it's very clear early on that while they are going to be dangerous and waiting for the doctor, who also knows they're going to be dangerous, to figure out exactly how they're going to be dangerous is not particularly compelling because we already know they are. The specifics of how they are is feels like more of a minor note. Uh, and there's also this thing where the, the Brigadier is going to blow up a quarry. 
that has where they believe all the autons that they're aware of up to that point are. And the doctor's very fixated on stopping them. And I wasn't entirely clear why. Because it's a quarry. There's nobody around. There should not be a risk of collateral damage, really. And the only thing that I could think of is sort of lingering, like, oh, why do they have to blow everything up? Annoyance from the Silurian story, but they don't connect it back to that. They don't make even a passing reference to that, or if they did, it was so passing, I missed it. So I wasn't entirely sure why the Doctor was so dead set on being sure to figure this out so that they wouldn't have to drop bombs on an otherwise unoccupied area. I don't know. It, it... I, I'm not saying there's no reason for the Doctor not to want them to do that. Another thing might be that he genuinely doesn't want them to kill the Autons and the Nestine. It's actually mentioned early on that the Nestine, you know, um, remnant from uh, Spearhead from Space is still around, partly because the Doctor feels like to get rid of it would be to kill something. So, like, that is in the mix, but they don't, again, they don't connect that. I've got to connect that dot. So, like, I can come up with reasons why, but again, for how much time was sunk into the Doctor trying to figure things out in time to stop them, I never quite understood why it mattered to him that much. Like, especially with everything else going on. I don't know. But for the most part, this was this was pretty good. This was solid, especially for, the, for this era. And it really does feel like it is solidifying what most of the remainder of Pertwee's run is going to be. So that's it. From me, folks, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Whatever your thoughts are on this episode, if you've watched it or if you haven't and you still have thoughts, sure, why not? Share those too. Drop them on down in the comments. Let's talk about it. I have a Patreon. It is what pays to keep this entire thing up and running and ensures that I can eat. And of course, like, share, subscribe, all those things. Greatly appreciated. You also don't have to because we take a relaxed attitude around here. So just come on back next time you need a break.